Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Board Explorer reading, book reading. We're back. We're back. We've had, um, I guess that's probably nearly two weeks off, isn't it? Uh, it's lovely to see you. Thank you very much for joining me on this blistering hot afternoon from the southeast. If you're in the southwest, I gather you've got rain, torrential rain and cool temperatures. Perhaps some of us envy you. I don't know. Um, I'm enjoying the heat, although it is, you know, day after day after day. Um, it, it can be a bit too much. Uh, good afternoon to Steve G, to Ed Loud, to Les Jarvis or Jervis. And to Adrian, TurboStream, lovely to uh, have you with us this afternoon. And anybody else who's happened to um, have come along, the Allotment Channel with Sean James Cameron. It's nice and cool in this room. I might just stay and suck on a fab lolly. How delightful. James Poulton, Moonrakers, people from Wiltshire. Uh, right. <laughs> OK. Sometimes apropos... Uh, it's marvellous. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, John Morris, good afternoon to you. Thank you for joining me. Uh, Lee Lawson, hello. Uh, people have remembered. They haven't forgotten. <laughs> Alfie Little, hello to you. It's nice to see you. Thank you so much. Hope you're all well and have got cold drinks or hot tea, actually, is very good um, to lower the temperature, apparently. Uh, a lot of people don't realise that, but uh, it's a fact. I'm totem pole. I've only got water in the studio to slurp on. Uh, the lovely Julia is, I think, going to be too busy because it, it's her son, uh, Joseph's, first birthday today. He is one. Her second son, that is. Of course, her other son is nine. Uh, we are reading The Wisdom of the Fields. This is the new book. We're going to give it a go. I've read some of it um, myself uh, just to sort of see how suitable it, it is going to be. Um, it is eating into my, not eating into, but it is um, continuing with my interest in the, the state of farms and things. This was written in the 1940s um, and H.J. Massingham wrote uh, a number of books uh, about the countryside, farming, um, English way of life and that sort of thing. So I wanted to touch into this. He's a little um, more involved than um, H.V. Morton, who was giving us some amusement as we read that. So this this may be different. It's certainly going to be different. Um, but also, unlike the one that we tried to read, uh, which was uh, A Cack-Handed War, um, which is a good book, but it's a book that you, you know, you need to sit and meditate with. Um, it's not as heavy as that, as far as I'm aware. Um, so that's good. Um, it starts off, the first chapter is, it is slightly different to the rest of the book from what I understand because it's about Cobbett, William Cobbett. And he starts back in the 18th century with William Cobbett and tells us a little bit about his life. And um, because I think because he sees him as one of the last crusaders who stood up for the labourer as opposed to the landed gentry, although he he thought there was a place for the landed gentry, um, but he thought that the landed gentry and the people, the, the farm owners and the new owners, ought to be looking after their staff. So, I'd, I, you know, it's difficult to gauge. Um, I read a, another book by... Um, Oh, a chap, I think, who, who, who... Did he start Private Eye or started The Spectator? One of those. I can't remember his name. Uh, Ri Richard... Oh, his name will come to me. Richard... Um, I want to say Evans, but I don't mean Evans. Um, I think he's got a son who is also in the business. Rich Ingram. Richard Ingram. That was the name I'm looking for. Um, and he wrote a biography about Cobbett, which I've read. Uh, I've got on my shelf and I've got Rural Rides, which I haven't read all of. I've dived into bits of it. It's one of those. It's quite a big, quite hard thing to read in one go. But it's a fascinating book. Um, and so he starts off with a bit of Cobbett. And then he talks about the different roles of farms and the roles labourers and people had in farms in the 1940s. 
fascinating to me particularly because as you are more than aware if you've been watching my videos recently of course I've been reading books by Colin Trudge, Graham Harvey, Marion Shord, Shored, Shored, I'm not quite sure, um, which is about the the um, the theft of the countryside, the the change in farming practices, the the what's happened to our food, the way that we farm, cramming food as quickly and as 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 harshly as they can into animals to fatten them up. Um, monoculture and all of that which um, I have to say sadly I have been ignorant on uh, when I've been walking around the countryside and not realising that the likes of WH Hudson, Richard Jeffries, Edward Thomas um, who were writing about the, the Downs particularly and how incredible and diverse the wildlife, the invertebrates and the, the, the flowers and the mammals and stuff were and the springy turf and not fully appreciating that what they were writing about had gone and has pretty much gone. And, and there are these tiny little oasis of wildlife and, you know, that, that, that gives you a the vaguest inkling into what it used to be for thousands of years, you know, for, for, for generations and generations um, from the time the Neolithics cleared the countryside and started to, to farm. And it's such a shame that it's all happened in 80 years and it's even sadder that it's all been done by the government with subsidies and forcing farmers into a position where they, they sort of have to accept this and it has forced many of the small mixed farms out because they can't compete with the big farmers who are now maximising their profits and farming as, as, as um, in a way that any corporate company would maximise its profits and, and get bigger and bigger and bigger at the detriment of the countryside by taking labourers off the land and in doing, doing so, spending little, if anything, in villages um, and the towns uh, and supporting a countryside network. Um, and it's only the smaller mixed farms that would, were doing that, really. And that's what we have to thank for the England that we look in picture books. Um, so anyway, so that's uh, that just uh, that's kind of gives you the, the sort of background to this book and where it's going. And it's interesting um, because I noted in a, I think it was, I don't think it was this book. I think it was another book of um, H.J. Massingham's. It's funny how the, <laughs> all of the authors that we've had, they're all, they're all by their initials. Uh, L.T.C. Rolt and um, J.B. Priestley, H.V. Morton. I don't read books where they've got a first name. <laughs> so... Uh, uh, that said, though, J.K. Rowling is a book that I, I, I'm afraid I don't agree with her politics, so I can't read her work. Um, and I know that might be very narrow minded, but it is not to do with farming. So uh, anyway, so. Yes, I was going to say that in another book of his written at the same time, he talks about this new style of farming that's coming in, the artificial nitrogens and the insecticides and stuff back then in the 1940s when it was just first being introduced and he warned against it. And here we are where the countryside has been obliterated. So um, my copy here is dedicated to somebody called Harry, which is uh, either that or he's saying hurry and get on with it, which he's probably doing. So uh, we're going to start with chapter one, Rider of the Shires. I will do my best to read this as, as well as I can. And you know that I occasionally stumble. Uh, hello to um, Alfie Little. Uh, I have your book. Fantastic. Um, ben Reeve, afternoon. Just had to grab a fab ice lolly from the freezer. Good for you. Turbo Stream, imagine being one. I, I, do you know, I can't. I can't. It's an interesting world that he is in today, is he not? 
I guess everyone would have said that, but um, particularly, I think it's an interesting world, challenging world for a one-year-old um, growing into. Uh, Geza 80, nice to see you back home. Thank you very much. A Christian soldier, uh, 36 Celsius here in Oklahoma today. Uh, not far off here. I mean, I don't know what it is. It's about 30. So I, Celsius jumps a lot, doesn't it? So that's pretty hot. I guess you've got uh, air conditioning. I don't have any air conditioning at all. Uh, Morton Lewis, hello to you. Morton Cobb, uh, William Cobbett is a, isn't a bad start. Absolutely. Relax and enjoy. Nice backdrop. Thank you very much. It's a bit cluttered and what have you, but we do our best. Uh, Ed Loud, nice to see you. Cynthia Pate, 33 degrees in Alabama this morning. Um, Reverend Flattus is sticky. <laughs> I'm not surprised. And uh, James Roberts, I live in Devon, just off the southern tip of Dartmoor. I don't think the country has been obliterated here. Um, good. I was reading about Dartmoor and Exmoor only this morning in Graham Harvey's uh, The Killing of the Countryside, which is a book he wrote, and it's in the 90s. I think it came out in 97, something like that. So it's 20-odd years old. Um, but he was, uh, I think Dartmoor is OK, but he was saying there is a lot of grass, more than the mixed culture of, um, there's more grassland because they were putting more sheep on than would ordinarily sustain sheep. And so they put more of this perennial rye grass to feed the sheep more quickly. And because of that, they were putting in artificial um, nitrogen but it's a chapter I've only just started so I haven't fully got that conversed into my head uh, George Mahoney have you ever been to Alfriston yes and I have got a video if you put Vobes and Alfriston into YouTube you'll see me rush through it from the church on the tie um, to the National Trust's first purchased house which is the clergy house there and then I walk up to the I go through the high street and then I go up to, um, what is it now? The It's like a little pepper pot thing, isn't it? Um, the lockup or the the rebuilt windmill. or I can't remember what it, what it is. But anyway, whatever that is, I walk up to that bit. Right, chapter one. Let's crack on with this. Uh, Rider of the Shires. I saw Great Cobbett riding, the horseman of the Shires, and his face was red with judgment and a light of Luddite fires. A trailing meteor on the downs. He rides above the rotten towns. The horseman of apocalypse. The rider of the shires. G.K. Chesterton. Starting that, um, this chapter. Chapter one. William Cobbett was born in 1762 at the old market town of Farnham in Surrey. I must go to Farnham fairly soon and have a look round because it's not that far. His grandfather had been a field labourer, but his father kept an inn and was an independent small farmer. Cobbett was fond of asserting that he couldn't remember a time when he did not earn his own living. When he was earning a few pennies a week, scaring birds off the crops, he was not old enough to climb the gates, and the tramp home was a task of infinite difficulty. But there was never a hint of bitterness or revolt in his references to those early years. He recalled with joy that he had been born and bred up in the sweet air. At twelve, Cobbett played truant by walking to London and on the way laid the foundations of his self-education by buying a copy of Swift's A Tale of a Tub on the road. Swift's, caus Swift's caus caustic tongue became his mentor. At 20, after failing to get into the Navy, he jumped into the London stagecoach and spent a miserable time in the Great Wen as an understrapping quill, dri quill driver. It was characteristic of him that rather than turn home, it, return home in the style of the prodigal son, he enlist in the 54th foot, 
went with his regiment to Nova Scotia, became a sergeant major, and in 1791 was discharged in honour. While engaged upon regimental office work, he had detected some of the officers percolating percolating funds that should have been spent upon the welfare of the men. On his return to England, he had a, fir he had a first skirmish with authority in his attempt to expose them. Fearing the consequences to himself when every me method was made to hush up the scandal, he packed off to France with the servant girl he married in Canada. No sooner had he set eyes on her than he had sworn that none but she would be his wife. And when, after a long absence, she returned to him, intact the money that he had given her for her needs, he married her at once. She proved a wife to him of the type whose housewifely virtues was later to praise in cottage economy and was his patient helpmate in all his enterprises and misadventures. They continued in France, where he taught English, until the discomfort of living there amid the turbulence of revolutionary politics drove him back to America, whose own revolution was behind it. But in America he discovered that he but sorry, but in America he discovered that he was an Englishman. He heard his country was vilified on all sides and he met more trouble as a hotly content contentious journalist under the name of Peter Porcupine. So virile and plain-spoken were his writings that when he returned to England in 1800, after a residence of eight years, he found himself something of a celebrity. He was welcomed by the War Secretary William Wyndham and his Tory followers who felt that his trenchant and passionate propaganda would serve as an effective political instrument. But Corbett, sorry, Corbett, not Ronnie Corbett, Cobbett was never a party man. His weakness and his strength lay in being a no man rather than a yes man. Even in his early years, he was not a ho he was not wholly a Tory. At his farmers at his father's inn, the Jolly Farmers, his father and his friends used to empty their mugs to the American colonists in revolt against King George. Cobbett's Toryism, under the patronage of Wyndham, was as much due to his experience of Americans' antagonism to England as to any nursing he received at the hands of the Tory party. This kind of Tory, Toryism Cobbett believed in and was what most Tories of this day had either forgotten or never known. Its first article was a fear of loathing. Oh, sorry, it's for... It's for what is he talking about? It's... Its first article was a fear of loathing. No, it wasn't. It was a fear and loathing of the new plura, plura, plu, plu, can't say this word without thinking very carefully. Plura, plu, plutocracy. Thank you. Got there in the end. Plutocracy, with which the Tories were becoming as entangled as the Whigs already were. For a time, Cobbett found himself able to work with Wyndham, who at who at last. Sorry, who I haven't done all this reading, so I'm cocking up right from the beginning. How about that? Um, for a time, Cobbett found himself able to work with Wyndham, who at least had a sentimental regard for that older England, which he held to be perishing at the hands of the new financial politics. But Wyndham's England was the England of the squirearchy, and so, cons comparatively speaking, modern. The land which Cobbett loved was immemorial. It didn't belong to any single class, and it was not a land in which only two classes could exist, the masters and the mastered. In the older England, there had not been but two. In the older England, there had not been two, but many classes. There was no bridgeless gulf between the peer and the poorest peasant. 
Between them had stood men of countless stations, in order, priority and degree, and Cobbett's Toryism in this respect was akin to Shakespeare's. England, he said, was advancing to that state in which there are two classes of men, masters and abject dependents. Disraeli's Two Nations in Sybil, and I assume that is a book, was exactly the same as Cobbett's Two Classes. It was not the England of yesterday or the day before that Cobbett wished to preserve. It was an England that had outlasted all the ages before them. And this is, a, 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 you know, you might think this is a little bit heavy on, on everything. Um, but th I think this chapter sort of sets up where Massingham wants to take our reflection of, of England. And I think this class system is, a, is an interesting part of it, because I think we very easily look at classes as the haves and haves not, because that's what we keep getting told at the moment. But I think there there is this blending of classes and nuances that was that we uh, that, that at the time people didn't see it as as quite in black and white terms. It, it, I I mean and, and I don't know I, I mean I don't know but I think I think that's where he's getting from that. But it, this is the great thing about sharing somebody else's work is that we can talk about it and debate it and and see if we both get I say both I mean all of us get similar things from the text. Uh, Cobbett's partnership with the Tories was therefore short-lived. At the end of it, he bought his farm at Botley and acquired the status of a yeoman. Having thus wedded himself to the soil out of which he was born, he might have expected to grapple himself to Toryism with hoops of steel. He did the exact opposite. The reason why Hazlitt charged him with outrageous inconsistency, and which is the reason, rather, that, that Hazlitt, uh, whomever he was, I guess a critic, charged him with outrageous inconsistency and headstrong fickleness. But why did Cobbett become a radical? He has himself explained his political change of coat in Two Penny Trash, the new edition in 1816 of the Political Register, the forerunner in reporting parliamentary debates of our Hansard. Some years ago, he wrote, I wrote a little book called Cottage Economy. It teaches the brewing of beer, the making of bread, the rearing of pigs and poultry, the keeping of a cow, the curing of bacon, and, in short, everything necessary to teach a small family how to make the most of a little bit of ground and how to live well by good management. But when I wrote that book, I told the reader that it would be of little use without a reform of the Parliament. It is a book that gets referred to quite a bit, and I must get a copy of it, Cottage Economy by um, William Cobbett. Uh, and I love the fact that he's teaching ordinary people in the 18th century. So, you know, if ever I get a bit of land and want to keep pigs and things, I would love to take his principles and see if I could work them. I mean, it would just be... It, wouldn't that be amazing? Um, unless, of course, it was morally wrong or detrimental to the animals. The radicals disunited in all else were at one time, sorry, were at, at one in demanding the abolition of the rotten boroughs and the, the reform of Parliament. But why was Cobbett so fiercely interested in this reform? Again, he gave his own answer. It may be asked, will a reform of the Parliament give the labouring man a cow or a pig? Will it put bread and cheese into his satchel instead of infernal cold potatoes? Will it give him a bottle of beer to carry into the field instead of making him lie down on his belly to drink out of the brook? Will parliamentary reform put an end to the harassing of men and women by a hired overseer to draw carts like beasts of burden? Will it put an end to the practice of putting up labourers to auctions like slaves in Carolina and Jamaica? Will it put an end to the system which caused the honest labourer to be fed worse than the felons in the jails? 
Will it put an end to the foul, the beastly, the nasty practice of separating men by force from their wives? The enemies of reform jeeringly ask us whether reform will do these things for us, and I answer directly, it will do them all. It would not only, he held, save the labourer from such degrad degradation by giving him the vote, but afford him the opportunity of recovering or holding fast to his plot of earth. It would help to reinstate the yeomanry, the small gentry, whose decline was interlocked with that of the labourer. But it would also relieve all the men of the land, landowners, farmers and labourers, together with the artisans of the new industrial towns, from the mounting burden of national debt and from the dead weight of the fund holders. Sincurists and pensioners. The reform, the reform bill would end the process by which the many poor were becoming poorer and the few rich, richer. So interesting to hear that 200 odd years ago, and here we are with similar accusations of the poor becoming poorer and the rich becoming steadily richer and richer beyond any dreams that um, Cobbett could possibly have had. Cobbett became a radical, that is to say, for the very reason commonly assigned to convert cons conservatism. I am a radical, he said, because radicalism means belonging to the root. Cobbett's kind of radicalism was the reverse of what it later became in the 19th century, a, a synonym for the progressive, who was to detach himself completely from both rural and traditional roots. And again, I mean, just listen to that language, a progressive who was to detach himself completely from both rural and traditional roots. And this is what we find with progressives at the moment, when we're told certain things are a progression. It's progressive, especially the progressive left. And it, it seems that so much wisdom is here. Um, the Reform Bill of 1832, passed by the Parliament, in which Cobbett sat as a member for Oldham, actually gave the vote not to the labourer, but to the new commercial middle classes, who represented the system of finance he hated. This reflects upon the blindness of his judgment, but not upon either his integrity or consistency. Riding the countries, touring the industrial north, addressing countless meetings, suffering two years' imprisonment in Newgate from 1809 onwards for denouncing the flogging of militiamen by German mercenaries, defending the Luddites in 1811 without countenancing their pitiable attacks on the machines that deprived them from their livelihood, issuing paper after paper, each with a circulation of 60,000, fulminating, there's a lovely word that you don't hear so frequently, fulminating against the game laws, against political jobbery, the building up of estates by the new rich, the enclosures, the Malthusians, the tithe-eating parsons, the tax-eating placemen, pouring out his personality and vitality not only against the imperial money power but scores of individual tax-gatherers and loan jobbers. He placed all his eggs in one basket. He staked all upon the reform bill and lost. <laughs> it is not too much to say that Cobbett paid for his error of judgment and the bitter disillusion disillusionment it brought him with his life. In the Parliament of 1832 he was little more than a backbencher and made no more impression upon his fellow members than upon the spring tide of the whole age that had turned 
against him. Three years later, he was dead. A broken man, and the vision of England he had presented in so luminous a style and so with so and with so disorderly a temper died with him. How could it have been otherwise, and what cup of a sharper poison could have been given him? Not only were all the manifold causes he had fought for tumbled in ruins and at the hands of the Parliament he had spent himself in building up, but the evils he believed to be sapping the lifeblood of his country were aggravated. If the 1832 Parliament reformed the rotten boroughs, it gave the cotton lords that commercial supremacy in buying cheap and selling dear they were to retain for nearly a century. Yeah. It passed the Benthamite New Poor Law, which enacted that a man too poor to keep himself and his family should be shut up in one of the new workhouses known as the New Bastilles. So far, so far from checking enclosure, it encouraged it until a whole process culminated in the General Enclosure Act of 1845. The votes went to the builders of the new prosperity, while the majority were left voteless until they had long forgotten their stake in the land and their intercourse with nature and were broken on the wheels of heavy industry. It was not for an England it was not for an England that was soon to become the workshop of the world that Cobbett had spent his life defending little workshops of the villages and market towns and the little plots of his ex-peasants. In advice to young men, he had written, I wanted to see no innovation in England, and now he was confronted with a hideous revolution that set itself to work to add to them the innovations and to enlarge those that already existed. He had been a champion of the unproprieted artisan and the dispossessed peasant, and henceforth his commoners were to be transmuted to the lower orders. He had maintained that all three layers of rural society, the resident native gentry attached the resident native gentry attached to the soil the farmers and the labourers were mutually interdependent and that an injury to one was an injury to all farmers he said make common cause with your labourers for you cannot exist without them the tax gathering presses the tax gatherer presses the landlord the landlord and farmer and the farmer the labourer. Here it falls at last, and the class is made so miserable that a felon's life is better than that of a labourer. Oh, yes, that a felon's... In other words, you know, you go to prisoner, you have a better life than being a labourer on the land. And this is so true. And I know that um, Lee um, will know all about this, having um, researched and um, co-written a book about the uh, immigrants that went to Canada in search of a better life. Uh, and she'll know so much more about the and the poor law and, and all of that. And it's um, a remarkable piece of work that she's done. But now, the but now the paper money system had been given a new lease of life by the moneyed interests of the new electorate and the displacement of the older gentry by the new rich, detached from the soil, proceeded apace. Even the old squires had become tax eaters as well as tax payers and lived not by their estates but their investments in funds. The corruption of the landed aristocracy, uh, the corruption of the landed aristocracy by the money power to which the shock of the reform bill had fully opened Cobbett's eyes became one of the main themes of Trollope's novels, Anthony Trollope that is, twenty years after his death. My God, there's a man who who never drew breath, Anthony Trollope, and the uh, output of his. But I tried reading some 
Um, and it is very good work. But Anthony Trollope, my God, he was a postmaster. Um, how he found time to write, big, you know, and, and keep up with Instagram and Facebook and YouTube. Oh, no, sorry, it wasn't around in Trollope's day. But um, the, the wealth of Trollope's novels and the, the size of them are just absolutely incredible. Uh, in the year before the Reform Parliament sat Henry Cook of Michael Dover, De De Mick Mickle Dever, um, Mickle Dever. I'll read that again because I'm not quite sure how you pronounce that. In the year before the Reform Parliament sat, Henry Cook of Mickle Dever, Dever had been hanged for knocking off the hat of Bingham Baring, a financier, and in the desperate revolt of the labourers under Captain Swing. Oh, that's all one sentence. I beg your pardon. In the year before the Reform Parliament sat Henry Cook of Michael Dever. No, I've still got that wrong. I will get this right because it doesn't make any sense otherwise. In the year before the Reform Parliament sat, Henry Cook of Michael Dever had been hanged for knocking off the hat of Bingham Baring, the financier, in the desperate revolt of the labourers under Captain Swing. Captain Swing was the period when the labourers were protesting against the new threshing machines and because they saw their livelihoods and their families starving, they started to protest and were ignored. And um, so they started to break some of the threshing machines and as a result many of them the ringleaders were uh, hanged and this guy obviously knocked one of these financiers hats off and that was enough to get him to court and hung uh, sorry hanged Corbett carried that judicial murder to his grave it became a symbol to him and he was a man much given to symbolism the finances of exact the finance of excess taxation and the debt system, the enclosures and the despair of the labourers became fused in his mind into the figure of Henry Cook. Perhaps his own despair after the passage of the Reform Bill saw the shadow of the martyr lad darkening the future of England. For he believed that the Reform Parliament had dealt a mortal blow at the peasant England for which Henry Cook had died. And that's the end of the first, the first part of the first chapter. There's, there's, it's quite a longish chapter and it talks about Cobbett. Um, but it, I think it is still worth pressing on with, even if it takes us a couple of days to get to it. Um, to the main beef of the book, because he talks about the workmen of the small town, he talks about the country workmen and the job, the Kentish countrymen, the cottagers, the Sussex, the Somerset yeomen, um, Cornish yeomen, the a good husband, and so on. So it is very important. Um, I don't know how you're finding it. Very different from um, H. V. Morton's work. Uh, lovely Julia is here. Lovely to see you. Hello, says uh, Brian Davis on this rather humid day. Hope it's cooler on the coast. No, not really. <laughs> uh, Snack Lofter says, off topic, your shirts always look so smart and crisply ironed. Thank you very much. Um, this one uh, was ironed, actually, and I'd, I, I know I ought to do more of that. I ought to iron them um, because I think it's, I think one should try and look presentable when you're presenting, but I don't always, it's, it is true to say. Um, just going through, just having a pause to, well, I can't find my mouse, where's my mouse gone, there it is, uh, to just have a quick look at the, the comments um, oh yes you, James Roberts says he doesn't think it's been obliterated, interesting, I've recently walked the South Downs way, thanks for the videos very informative and helpful, says George O Mahoney, is that Ma George O Mahoney um, have you ever been, oh you, you asked uh, Alfreston, yeah that's right uh, Justice uh, Justine Jones, hello to you. Thank you very much. Cottage Economy Modern Edition is five pound forty nine on the dreaded Amazon. I must get a copy. Um, yeah, I must get a copy uh, just to have it to, to refer to. Uh, we face the same. I wonder what it's on Abe Books. A B E Books might be a bit cheaper there. Sometimes I buy from them. Um, 
Cynthia Pate, we face the same evils today, both in the UK and the US. I mean, it's interesting, you know, 200 years, the parallels, the parallels. Um, I thought I would have a name change today, says Michael White instead of Michael Angel. Nice to have a, a, a name change. Uh, his wife was a trollop. <laughs> Thanks, Morton. Uh, hello, Michael White, everyone's saying. Michael White, Michael Angel, I have several non-diplumes to avoid the inland revenue and other authorities. A good idea. Uh, hi, Cynthia. Cynthia Pate says, trying to thank God for selling ceiling fans. Yes, a lot of my fans are on the... Hello, boys and girls. They're up there spitting on me, keeping me cool. Um, there is a fine biography of the Captain Swing riots by E.J. Hobsbawne. Obviously, that's a book that I must read because it's got the guy's initials rather than his name. Probably Edward John, is it? Edward John Hobsbawne. I wonder if that is it. I'm going to look that up. Hang on. I, that, this is the moment where we just enter the surreal world. I'm going to copy that. I'm going to read a bit more. I'm going to try and read a bit more because uh, I just want to look that up now because and, and names the book's... The authors with initials do interest me now. Eric. OK, I got that wrong. What did I say? Edward. Oh, I said Edward. Eric Hobsbawne. Eric John Ernest Hobsbawne was a British historian of the rise of industrial cat capitalism, socialism and nationalism. Uh, funnily enough, he was born in Alexandra in Egypt he died in 2012 in London. Hmm. I shall leave that there. And no doubt end up buying more books. Uh, it's slightly heavy but intellectually fascinating. Lee Lawson says, Thank you for mentioning the research I did for the publication on Petworth emigra Immigration Scheme in 2000. It wasn't just me. I know, I can't remember if your um, co-author who set the thing rolling, but... Um, I know that, and sadly, she died when you just before or just after it was published and you either had to finish it or whatever you, and you worked or you started on another book about um, the wife, the fascinating wife. Is it Elizabeth um, Wyndham? Is it Wyndham, the third Earl of Egremont at Petworth? Um, it's a book I must read at some point. I must buy and read uh, because I'm fa I am fascinated. I don't know how much it has about the the third Earl of Egremont. I know when I was living in Petworth, well, not when I was living, when I made my Petworth video, fascinated because he seemed to be for um, landed gentry of the time, George, was it George? George Wyndham, wasn't it? Um, he seemed to be benevolent as uh, G Gingham. Oh, yes, live. Is that, was that her, was that her maiden name? Or did, or I, what was the, or did they not? How did that work? Because wasn't he a Wyndham? George Wyndham. Wasn't he a Wyndham? Um, I'm not quite sure how that works, but anyway. Um, yeah, so he was... And I know he used to have big... He used to have uh, in the lawn at Petworth House big parties, didn't he? And when I say part, part, I mean once a year. I can't remember what, he, what they called it now. But there was a staff ball. But it was not a staff ball, but a staff picnic with trestle tables and uh, labourers and workers were invited. And um, and if I'm right, if I remember rightly, at one of the points where there was so little work around, he, that's when he got them to build the wall around. And, and I think this story, I don't know whether it's true or apocryphal or is what many of them did. But he he employed workers to build the wall in order to keep the workers having work when um, there was so little work around. And, and of course, his estate, I can't remember what it is. It's something like 15 miles or something ridiculous all the way around his estate if you walk the perimeter. Um, yes, George Wyndham, her maiden name. Oh, yes, always looks peculiar. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, anyway, so let's carry on with a bit more reading. Thanks for that, Lee. Um, and, uh, yeah, if anybody's interested, do check out um, the Petworth Emigration Scheme and uh, look for Lee Lawson's name and your um, the, the lady that was that you did the research with you. It's um, a fascinating thing and um, it's well worth looking into. And 
what was the name of the rector there who oh he had an interesting name didn't he the rector whose name oh i should remember this i did a little piece on him i can see him i can see the picture of him interesting bloke um it was like it had a name like pocket not pocket was it pocket it was something like that pocket or <laughs> was it pocket you, you'll remember these names. It was a very interesting name. It's going to come up in a minute. You're, you're typing it. I can feel you're typing it. What was his name? The Reverend Socket. <laughs> Thomas Socket. Thank you so much. I was like, pocket, that wasn't right. Socket. Socket to him. Right, anyway. This is part two of chapter one. Uh, we'll carry on. Hope you're enjoying this. I hope this is interesting and um, you're getting something from it. It's It's all good fun. Uh, by the way, if you're enjoying it, do give us a like. It, it lets me know whether you actually enjoy it or not. Um, so part two, here we go. If Cobbett be cut to the measure of his own age, his life was a total failure. <laughs> no sooner was the most powerful political writer of the day, as Hazlitt called him, buried with his father, his father's, in the churchyard of Farnham. I must go and look up his grave, actually, if he's in the churchyard of Farnham. Then he was forgotten. Even his own people forgot him, as the countrymen sucked into the factories of the industrial wens were in one generation to forget the fields that had been their fathers for a thousand years. And that's, that's really pitiful. That, re that gets at my heart. I don't know how much, how emotional, how, what emotions you are as people. He, let me just read that again, because that's amazing. So he was there for the, the peasant farmers and he, he really believed that the soil was part of your, you know, your blood, as it were. Because food is is the thing that we we now take for granted. And, and he understood so that that connection in such a huge way, it seems. But so as soon as he was dead, people forgot him and even his own people forgot him as the countrymen were sucked into the factories of the industrial wens were in one generation to forget the fields that their fathers had been had, had been their fathers for thousands of years so they forgot the fields and the way of life we've forgotten you know i mean 200 years later obviously we've we but we are so far removed from food and its production and um, we don't like to look now at how the food is produced because it would scare us. You know, we can't look at factory chickens, for example, because we would vomit into a bucket if we really saw what was going on. So it's all right in the nice packaging with a picture on a farm and we can do that. But actually, if we look at the state of how it is. And so it's very hard to watch those images. And and, and we, we let ourselves, I'm sure this happens, I'm sure that we let ourselves be sold the story that this is the only way that we can feed everybody, that it has to be mass production. And I don't believe that for a moment. I used to think that. I used to think that, but I think my eyes have been open. I, my eye, I've got one eye. Um, my eye has been opened. And I don't think that that is true. I don't think we need to feed people that way. And I don't think that how we feed people is good um, or even nutritious anymore and look at the obesity and the problems that we have anyway um were this so so his life is saying is it was a failure were this failure and this forgetfulness purely the consequence of defects in his character and education which bitterly resented and ultimately brought him into disrepute was it was it that on the modern reader cobbett leaves an impression of a wild dispersion of energy his lack of self-discipline creates a sense of waste and frustration and he too often confounds his onslaughts on abuses with personal abuse of individuals he was not the man to let i dare not wait upon i would and never pause to ask whether it would be wiser not I'm not quite sure what that means i dare not wait upon i would he was just as self-confident about things he failed to understand as about those he knew better than any man in England. And I think there's an element of that in all of us, is there not? I mean, I am often um, self-confident through ignorance, really, but I, it seems to be right uh, about things that I actually know very little about. 
but then at the same time, he, he was very confident about the things that he knew better than anybody in England, is what he's saying. Often he hit right and left in a kind of frenzy and charged as blindly as a rhinoceros. Among his host of enemies, the worst was not infrequently himself. Though he possessed a style like a steel blade, he often used it like a club. The wind that, fins, that fills his sails was partly that of a titanic vanity, but it was purely personal and has an element of naivety. His conceit had nothing to do in it of calculating egotism. He was a man of wrath, but no Stiggins. I don't know if Stiggins is a Dickens character. Does anybody know? Is Stiggins a, a, an unpleasant, egotistical Stiggins um, uh, uh, Dickens character I, I'm assuming that's where that is often he was needlessly provocative he rode round and round Dundas at High Clear merely to annoy a man whose politics he detested good for him and with his son went whip cracking and hullabalooing to torment the Botley Parson which Sorry, when he sensed, and sensed rightly, that there was defilement in the air, he couldn't contain himself. He roared aloud and plunged without first probing into the details of the scandal. He was always the intuitive man and fatal impetuosity translated his detections into instant action. His attack on Peel in the House of Commons is a classic example of his rightness in smelling out corruption and complete wrongness in the details and direction of his attack. Peel, uh, I assume this is Peel the, um, what's his, what was his first name? Peel, uh, the guy who set up the police, who was um, Prime Minister, wasn't he? Had not manipulated the currency in order, as Cobbett said, to increase the value of his ministerial salary, salary but the manipulation for which Peel's bill was largely responsible had fattened the new rich, of whom it was easy not to see only why Creevy called Cobbett a foul-mouthed and malignant fellow, but how apt he was to arm his adversary with both hands. These weapons were his own mistakes. Some bits he's referencing stuff which really is, uh, you know, probably of the time, and, and if you know a bit about politics, you probably understand it. I don't, so um, try and get, go past those bits too quickly. Uh, John Peel. No, not John, not John Peel. The, um, not John Peel... <laughs> The, who used to do Home Truths on BBC Radio 4 and was the music guy. Not not that Peel, no. Um, but all this was not the ultimate cause of the hatred. Sorry. But all this was not the ultimate cause for the hatreds his hates aroused. He was feared as well as derided and scorned. Authority did not heed his warnings and dark prophecies, but it trembled lest he should rise up the dispossessed against it. It prosecuted him in those fears and was discomforted. And if the Reform Bill had given votes to a determining majority, minority, majority, yeah, sorry, if the, and if the Reform Bill had given votes to the de a determining majority of English people, it is likely at least some of Cobbett's aims would have been achieved. For the machine workers in the new towns were still, when the bill was passed, conscious of their peasant stock. He was feared too because he told the truth about a number of things which almost everyone in public life, then and for generations to come, wanted to conceal, not only from the public, but also from themselves. Cobbett himself cannot be understood unless the nature of those truths be realised. It's clear that he did not foresee the years immediately ahead of him when he was riding up and down English country in the 1820s reporting for his political register and haranguing a labourer met upon the road or a crowd gathered to hear him, he was usually a prophet of the immediate wrath to come. The wrath did not come. On the contrary, it appeared as though events had falsified his predictions. 
the intoxicating if most unequally distributed the intoxicating if most unequally distributed prosperity of the mid victorian age lay immediately ahead the mood that heralded it was complacent and optimistic and so a fertile soil for the doctrine of automatic and inevitable progress unknown for a hundred years before sorry I'm, I'm not really reading this terribly well but I gather from this that he had completely not predicted the future Cobbett's truths were timeless ones because they were founded upon first principles but time must take time to bring in their revenges their incidents fell not upon his contemporaries nor their successors but ourselves and I think this is the important bit so in other words from what I get from that is he predicted things that didn't come to pass immediately and people thought well it's not happened what's he on about all of this you know people from the town going to working in the in the uh, industrial revolution in the mills and things like that and that, that we've started to see prosperity and stuff and what Massingham is saying is that his predictions were too early, that they were centred too much on the, the immediate and the next generation. But actually, it's, it's uh, 150 years later, and, and, and even now, I suppose, is that, that's what I'm getting from. I don't know whether you agree with me. Um, yeah, so, the, so, the, um, so, his first, so his, this first principle seemed to be, you know, you need men to work the land. And if we go into what we would now look as um, globalisation and um, mass intensive farming, you're, you've, uh, you've sort of ignored our first principles. Anyway, so um, the incident fell upon his contemporaries, not their successors, but ourselves. Thus, quite apart from the personal antipathy he aroused among his opponents, the fear of him was mixed with the contempt felt for him who cries wolf. Wolf when no wolf comes. So they felt content with him because he kept saying everything was going to go into disaster and it didn't seem to then. The superficial evidence was all against him and the times, in a scornful obituary notice, in a scornful obituary notice, dismissed him as an episode. Disraeli said in Conning's B, which I guess is another book, the spirit of the age is the very thing that a great man changes. Cobbett was too great a man to be carried away by it, to drift with it, to bow to it, as not to be avoided. He was not great enough to turn it, but the fact that he withstood it is a sign not of his weakness, but of his strength, and the forces arrayed against him were gigantic. Would a man of greater wisdom, of a more formal education or, and of a superior strategy have prevailed against them? He stood against them like a bull struck with darts in the ring and he stood alone. For his was the world of the new industrialism which Blake had foreshadowed in his dark satanic mills and Cobbett's ex commoners were being rapidly absorbed into it into it it was a world that was beginning to think in terms of the inorganic and controlling the forces of physical nature but when Cobbett thought of nature he was thinking of the fields he knew little fox hanger the seven acres Hawcroft, priestcroft barley close grunt drove meadow plots of land that demanded individual treatment Individual, individual treatment and had been named by his people who for centuries had had, the res had a responsible stake in them. It was a world about to set forth upon the conquest of nature and Cobbett's idea of man's function was for him to cooperate with nature in the management of living growth. It was above all a period of expansion propelled by the application of cheap power and the progress of mechanical inventions. The way of life that Cobbett taught was the very reverse. The view of his extensive movement is given in Cottage Economy, £5.99 on Amazon, which is a treatise of intensive husbandry. This expansion, the opposite of 
conservation was accompanied as time went on by social disintegration. Cobbett was an apostle of holding the fabric of things, both in society and among individuals, together. The new machine power was not in itself a cause of a revolutionary attitude to old values and stabilities. It was a terribly effective instrument of it. The real cause was the dominance of a new state of mind which used the machine to accomplish its ends and as its powers grew became more and more impatient of traditionally religious and ethical checks upon economic expansion. Those ends were the pursuit of wealth, not for any specific social purpose, but as a standard of value in itself. Cobbett's perception of this was at the root of his constant and often bewildering diatribes against finance. Thus, ends were beginning to be lost in means, and just the same process of confusion was happening to the machine itself. Progress began to be identified with technical advances and from this fusion arose the theory of a progress that was inevitable. That is to say, progress was in itself regarded as a machine and so became separated, separated from growth, which is an organic process. The effect of the machine went further than throwing the skilled handloom weavers into the towns out of work and breaking up the cottage crafts that Cobbett loved. By the immigration of their rural workers to the new industrial towns. In opposing this drift and trying to reintroduce certain of the crafts, Cobbett stood like a barrier reef against the whole sea of change. But how great a change he hardly knew. The mechanisation of the work went further than the creation of such squalor, poverty and slum conditions as Disraeli described in Sybil. So in other words, I mean, I'm sure you've got all of this and I'm interpreting it as I go. But in other words, he's saying that, that Cobbett, a man of his time and stubborn and a stick in the mud and what we would what would we call a Luddite, I suppose now, wouldn't we? We would say that somebody is a Luddite because... He, his first principles was the land and the nurture of the land and husbandry. And in came this new technology, which he saw as, as, as evil. And, and he could see that, that, that the progression that Massingham here describes is that everyone got carried away with it to the point that this was a way of making money so that it wasn't making money for the good of mankind but making money for the good of a very few who would get richer and richer and the people who worked its lives were not improved at all they were in fact living in squalor in the smoke filled cities doing incredibly long hours and not eating fresh fruit and vegetables and, and working harder and harder for smaller and smaller money because that's where the work was. And that the progress was that it was for the sake of itself, you know, for the sake of money, not the sake of the good of mankind. And, and that's what Cobbett saw. And, um, and, and he was right. And it seems that we're in exactly the same situation with corporates who seem to... You, you know, I mean, I'm I'm a capitalist. I believe that it's 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 good to have an idea, to set up a business, that in that business you can make a profit, so that you can look after the people who you are employed, and say, look, this is working, aren't we? This is great. Let's share in some of the profit. Okay, it's my idea, and I spent that, so I'll have a a, a slightly bigger portion, but. I want to make sure you and your families are looked after and that we can all continue together. And there's that measure of um, capitalism. And then there's the, ah, but if we take over this and take over that, and, and actually what we'll do is we'll smite that person over there and we'll put our, our supermarket next to all these individual shops. And because we have so much more clout, these guys can't actually supply the local people with the same food at the price that we can because we can now 
come in and, and say to the farmers, we're not buying it at what you sold it before because that doesn't suit us. Never mind whether it suits you and the people that you employ and the families that your employment supports and the community that your families and the farm and the shops and stuff all support. Never mind all of that. We can actually come in and get, and say to everybody, we can make it even cheaper. And actually, by doing so, put all these people out of work because the farmer now no, can no longer compete. So he's having to cut his losses. And part of his losses is employment. And those people now can't work on the farm. And the shops that were... In com were, you know, the greengrocer, the butcher and all the rest of it, they can't compete with these big companies who are now saying, but you can have these cuts of meat so much cheaper. The fact that we are stuffing animals at the huge amount of um, rate and growing them up and treating them harshly, that don't worry, you'll never know about that because they'll just be provided in a nice little polystyrene thing and put with a bit of... Um, plastic on the top, you know, and that's actually bad for the environment instead of you turning up with your little wicker basket made from local um, um, willow or whatever. N never mind all of that whole old style of living, but that form of corporation is going to... And we're calling that progression, progressive, and it's just making less people... Um, richer and, and it depends what you call by rich doesn't it is your life enriched and people you, you know and you can see that that's what he foresaw and nobody believed and here we are with it and it's it's fascinating it's fascinating um i shall end there on today because i've gone over the the hour and i didn't want to but i just wanted to get and make a make a a good head start um, in this there's a the couple bits more on on Cobbett and stuff and then we'll get into the state of farming and the wisdom of the fields for sure um, as we as we plow through as we plow uh, through this thank you very much um, vintage creative media Richard will you please make the audio from these readings available as mp3 so I can listen without having to be on my computer that's a good idea I hadn't thought about that um, I'll see if I can download them I um, and then I guess I'll need to set up some sort of podcast thing so that people can access them. Leave that with me. I'll um, And if Julia is still there, please can you remind me? Uh, the Allotment Channel, I like a slice of Madeira cake. Uh, sounds about right. Uh, peelers are not what they used to be. Uh, people often don't plan for long term. That's very true. Look at the government now. Um Corbett will be exonerated by history. And I think he is. I mean, I think he is. But, yes, you could see that you could, as as Massingham was saying, he was a stuck in the mud. And he, he was, he, he, the thing is, we probably had to go through all of this. You know, we couldn't have just stopped. Nothing, nothing was going to stop invention. Um, and invention leads to greed. Uh, and, and I think we've all seen that. Um, Andrew Norris says um, there are various apps that you can download which enable you to make your own mp3s recording I make my own every evening I guess if I do it though it saves a lot of people the effort I've just ordered Cottage Economy on A Books 9 with taxes and shipping it, yeah by the time I get there everyone's going to have bought every one of them money has become a joke since they got rid of the gold standard money is now worthless says Michael uh, well, that's what's going on now with Davos. The current crisis is to actually eliminate human beings for AI. Yeah, there you go. That's slightly worrying, isn't it? People are blinded by the false flags, says Michael. Morton says uh, that's what's going on. The crisis, the West currencies are worthless. China will become in buying everything up. Always a pleasure, says Turbo Stream. Just tuned in to, in to, hear, to hear your rant. Well said. Thank you, uh, Sandy, Wiltshire man. Um, Chris, hello, Richard from Southwick. Hello, Chris. The lovely Julia. Nice. Mum, Dad, my younger brother, his finances, and Jojo, and I enjoyed that. Thank you for... Oh, did you? <laughs> well, I don't expect you to... It's, it's poor old Joseph's... Uh, not poor, but he's lovely. It's his, it's his birthday. He doesn't want to be sitting here listening to me ranting on about... Uh, William Cobbett and um, H.J. Massingham. 
but um, a poor tender for the future. It, and it's interesting. I'll tell you what's really interesting, and I will go and let you go. Um, it's fascinating when you're reading this stuff, and there's me being all intellectual and referencing things that I'd forgotten I knew. You know, if you'd said, oh, did you know about... And suddenly there am I telling you about the the, the, the Captain Swing and, and all of that. And I'm, you know, some of these things I'm going to get wrong. People are going to get right. Uh, and the poor law and things like that. You, you know, there are so many more qualified people than me. And I'm not an expert in anything. But a smattering of some of that reading that I do, you know, I never know whether it's going to lodge in my brain. But, you know, it, it, for me, this is so... So it's, it's like doing university. This is This is like learning and talking and exchanging ideas this is what you know whether they whether we agree with them or disagree with them this is this is a sort of an my own open university as it were good readings day i'm i'm enjoying the book oh good thank you very much uh nigel sadler sounds like i've just missed something interesting yeah i think it, i think this is i think it is interesting um i think it's a good choice of book michael white ah you know much how joseph loves you so it was no problem we just had round one of barbecue food oh how lovely i've got to try and rustle up some baked beans on toast or something <laughs> uh, the allotment with sean says set up for soundcloud account for your podcast book readings will be successful good idea soundcloud yeah that's a good one good thank you for that right i'll let you go uh, back again tomorrow i'm out in the morning doing some forest bathing uh, making a video but we'll be back by four o'clock to do the next bit of this thank you so much for coming along it's lovely to see you and thank you for being uh, there for me as well thank you Richard wonderful reading great book with current issues it's and it isn't it amazing how these things history repeats itself and how things are so relevant um, give us a thumbs up if you've enjoyed it and I will catch up with you tomorrow but in the meantime bye bye uh, Vogue show tonight at eight o'clock of course um we won't be talking about this. We'll just be a bit of silly nonsense, I think, is what uh, what that's all about. Take care. Uh, give my regards to your mum and um, Tom and um, oh, um, Anna, if she's there, and to the rest of your family. Uh, lovely Julia, if you're still watching. And if they're still there, that would be great. Uh, John F., thanks, Richard. Um, yeah, back on tonight, 8 o'clock, on the Vogue Show channel, which is a different YouTube channel. Just look for the Vogue Show, um, 8 o'clock UK time. Take care and bye-bye for now. Bye-bye. <laughs>